uh, the office is going to turn it on in a second here for everyone, for the world. So I just want to check. This, this is the first one of these that we're doing. So we started in just one second as soon as this cover screen comes off. All right, we're live. So, uh, good morning, everyone, or wherever it is that you are. Uh, it's the first of uh, our Venice Live sessions, and I'm absolutely thrilled to, um, to, to, to share the time with you. Um, you know, I think uh, it's Monday, but it doesn't feel like Monday. Every day sort of feels the same right now, and we thought that this would be a fun way to, um, to keep us all connected during this very, very um, strange time. And I'm absolutely delighted to have two fantastic guests with me today, Luca Currado of Vietti uh, and Alessandro Masnaghetti, uh, in case anybody asks me any really difficult questions that I can't answer about the venues. I figure I have the master. So um, thanks guys for being here. Uh, we're getting a ton of questions coming in and um, we'll get to those in a second. But before we get started, Luca, uh, obviously we're all looking at the situation in Italy very carefully. And um, just curious to hear a little bit. First of all, your family is safe, uh, especially your mom and, um, and your family. But I just would like to hear a little bit about sort of what the what the environment is like. Because we can talk about flying, obviously, we will have, we'll have fun in a few minutes. But just curious to get a sense of you on the ground. What's it like right now? Hey, ciao, ciao, Antonio. Ciao to everybody. Uh, so, sorry for my English. Uh, and uh, but yeah, uh, it's a very strange moment because uh, you know our generation did not uh, saw any war uh, because uh, the only the generation previous uh, our generation so my father my mother or uh, they they saw a war and I think this is for us uh, is the closest thing as uh, we can imagine to a war uh, here uh, we are very scary about uh, is very the news uh, you know i wanted to stop uh, to see the news because it looks like a war every day and uh, it, it, we are afraid because when you see the police uh, and the soldier on the street uh, uh, trying to you know avoid that people goes around uh, and uh, for us uh, is uh, 33 days that we are close at home and uh, fortunately, we can work in the vineyard because Mother Nature doesn't stop. But, uh, you know, it is a war. And uh, we need to do our part and stay home and enjoy, spend time with friends <laughs> and talk about wine and try to, to smile a little bit. And this is a very, very important. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a very significant time. Um, so we thought it would be fun to have people open up whatever wines they wanted and to ask questions um, and really try to make this as educational and as fun as possible. I see, Luca, you are already breaking the rules by tasting a wine that has nothing to do with Piedmont. <laughs> <laughs> but before we talk about that wine, I um, want to share a quick little story because the, the Vietti winery is, one of, is a winery that um, well, Eric Guido is drinking 2006 Vietti Castiglione, so bravo. <laughs> um, uh, I have, uh, I first started drinking these wines probably when I was too young to drink, but my, you know, some of you might know that my parents had a wine shop when I was a teenager, and one of the wines we sold was Vietti Dolcetto. And so that was how I got to know th th this estate, your estate, and as I got older, then I, you know, started tasting Barbera and other wines. But when I would go out to dinner in a nice restaurant, I would always order a bottle of Getty Dolcetto because I knew what I was going to get. And so this estate is an estate that I've known for, I don't know, 25 or 30 years. Uh, and I've had the privilege of tasting a lot of these wines uh, over time. Uh, I have this wine, which we'll talk about a little bit later. This is 1999 Ravera, which uh, I bought at your winery. Not this bottle, but I did buy it there when it was unreleased. And some people might find it hard to believe, but this prosperity, the prosperity that we're seeing right now is very recent. Because I remember when this wine was released, 
I wasn't writing about wine and anybody could get an appointment to go visit any winery in Piedmont. And a lot of wineries would sell wine direct. A lot of wines had, a lot of wineries had more than one vintage on their Listino Prezzi, which is hard to imagine because today everything is uh, reserved and uh, sold out well in advance. But that's very new because back when I started visiting your winery, like yours, like every other, had all the wines for sale. You could buy as much Barolo as you wanted. Unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of money. Uh, multiple vintages at many estates. And today we're in a totally different world. So when I think about this bottle, I think about those, some of my very early tastings and uh, a lot of wines that you and Elena opened up for a person who was, a, who was just a regular person, just like anybody else. So uh, anyway, so now, but as I was saying, this is supposed to be a Piedmont seminar, but you're breaking the rules already because you're tasting wine that's not from Piedmont. <laughs> but <laughs> region, it's the one region that is um, near and dear to all of us, which is uh, Champagne. So tell us about the wine that you are tasting because it's one of our favorites. But I think uh, the reason is because preparing to this meeting that I didn't know what to expect. Uh, and so every time that I'm a little bit uh, afraid uh, or uh, so I had, uh, I open uh, some uh, bubble that give me fun and uh, happiness and uh, champagne uh, is the, is this one. I was saying that uh, for us uh, as a Barolo producer, uh, you know, we, 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 co we say that there are uh, wines called not Alta Langa, that Alta Langa is a fantastic wine, but Altra Langa is the other Langa. <laughs> there are two other Langa. One is a Champagne and the other is Burgundy. <laughs> so this is the reason. I, I'm not too far away from, uh, from Langa. This is just Altra Langa. <laughs> that uh, is uh, from a uh, dear friend, uh, Rudolf Peters, that he makes a uh, brilliant uh, Champagne. And uh, I love and enjoy. I trade uh, with him as uh, many other Burgundy producer or for champagne producer, that is the, this is the best part of the, the barter, the exchange, and uh, this comes from uh, uh, this sink. But I have other wines uh, to drink, you know, I have uh, other wines. Uh, I open also other wines, and some from Piemonte, and some from, uh, from Lange. So it's going to be a nice dinner at your house after this is done. <laughs> see, see. Uh, Elena will be very happy. Yeah, okay, good. Um, I'm curious what. Um, so there's a let's add, there's one question that I think is always interesting, which is sort of when should you drink wine? Um, and one of our viewers now is asking. He's got a 1.5 liter of Yeti per Bacco 2013. When would you? When do you think is a good time to drink it? I uh, I love I love per Bacco because per Bacco is uh, uh, grow with me. I was one of my first project in the winery uh, with my father. And uh, when uh, I started uh, to work uh, in the early 90s, and uh, I had this fantastic uh, patrimony of uh, vineyards, of crew MGA uh, available. And uh, my, my father, uh, uh, you know, when the first time that uh, allowed me to touch uh, some red wine, <laughs> some wine, uh, so I started to vinify separately uh, all the vineyards of Barolo and, uh, you know, the one that they choose we put in the Castiglione and the other in the Perbacco. So for me, Perbacco is our, uh, my baby Barolo. And uh, he, to go to the answer of uh, your friends, uh, is a wine that potentially has age as a Barolo, little bit drinkable, the drinking window is uh, more larger, uh, so it starts to be drinkable sooner. So I think the 13 right now, uh, is, uh, is a lot of fun. And uh, I had recently and uh, uh, open uh, with a group uh, of friends, not now because we cannot get together too much, <laughs> but uh, wait that uh, this will be a good battle to share uh, with your friends uh, after the quarantine, let's say. Perfect. I think a lot of bottles are gonna get shared after the quarantine. <laughs> um, so, you know, I put this picture up on Instagram uh, right before this tasting that showed what our tastings are like. Uh, I'm going to ask Alessandro in a second to show us some of the some of his maps, but you know, you're, I, I'm sure that there are some large cooperatives that do this as well, but you make wine from all 14 villages in the Barolo area, correct me if I'm wrong, which is very unusual. 
So when, when we do those tastings, you, there's like a sort of a whole panorama of villages. There's lesser known villages, there's the really important ones. There's ones that a lot of producers didn't buy separately, but you like them better in a blend. And so what is that, uh, what does that experience teach you about, because you basically have Perbaco, which is a blend of, of vineyards. Then you have Barolo Castiglione, which is a blend of vineyards, and then you get into your small vineyards. So when you think about the panorama of sites, how does that, how do you put together that wine? Because that's one of your wines that's still, uh, I love drinking Roca di Castiglione. I, I like drinking this too, but I can't afford these wines every day. Tobacco is a wine that most people can still. So what's your approach to putting that together, that blend? Well, first of all, when we do this testing that you took that picture, uh, I want to give you just a little bit insight for, it's a huge stress for us eh, when you arrive in the cellar. <laughs> <laughs> because your testing is not just regular testing, it needs uh, one day or two days of preparation. But basically, it's more or less uh, what we do in the cellar with uh, my worker, with Elena, and uh, with my worker when we taste the wine. And uh, your reader, maybe they will know that when you come, you know, we taste every single vineyard vinified separately in multiple vintages. I think probably it's something closer when you do the champagne, you know, when you do the Grand Claire or when you do it with champagne. And uh, so we, we taste, uh, maybe last time uh, we had uh, the, after the, the harvest, uh, the 19, um, uh, 19 uh, the 18, uh, the 17, and the 16 from the bottle. So it's two full hours, three full hours of full tasting. And it's very interesting, you know, to, to put aside by side all these vineyards. And for us, uh, like, like I said, we, we, we had this uh, fantastic uh, fortune to have all these crew from uh, these uh, uh, 11. We, we are from 10, the, the village, actually, the, 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 the total. Uh, but uh, many have been patrimony of the family from uh, ever. Uh, other, my grandfather, my father, and some uh, we put chaser, and we have a really fantastic collection of uh, MGA. And uh, I hope maybe one day or the other, somebody called Mappa Man, he will be able also to make uh, you know classification A, B, C crew. That would be fantastic for us. Yeah, but uh, sure we, no, we have a really on him first before. <laughs> no, we are very, very good. And so some of them, they do their own road, like Roque, Lazzarito, Brunate, Ravera, recently Cerequi and Monvigliero. They, they are venefied, aged, and bottled separately. But we have many other, uh, like uh, Ginestra, Mosconi, Fiasco, uh, Boschi, Brico Boschi. So we have uh, uh, Roque dell'Annunziata, Fossati, uh, Bussia. Uh, you know, Rave, uh, part of Ravera, and, uh, many, many, 11 of them, of very important crew. We venefy and age separately. Then at the last moment uh, before battling, uh, with Elena and, uh, and the, the people in the winery, in a blind tasting, we select uh, the four, the five, the six of them uh, that they get together better and we blend to make the Barolo Castiglione. With the remaining cask of Barolo not being used, uh, we make uh, the, the, the Perbacco. But the idea is very interesting because uh, uh, go back to many, uh, many years ago when I was very young and I worked in California, uh, it was in 1990. Uh, I had the privilege to work before in, in Burgundy, in Burgundy, sorry, in Bordeaux, uh, in, a, in a beautiful winery that I learned a lot, uh, it was uh, Mouton Rochil, uh, with Patrick Leon, Eric Tourbier, fantastic person. Uh, and then uh, I went to California, I worked a little bit for them in Opus One, but also in a winery called Long Vineyards, doesn't exist anymore, fantastic wine, and uh, Simi. And I worked there uh, with uh, Zelmang, uh, at the time, uh, she was one of the first uh, women winemaker of uh, California. Incredible, with strong women. Huh? And uh, 
I remember that uh, she, the consultant uh, there was a French uh, unknown guy called Michel Roland. Uh, that easy English uh, was not fantastic, and he knows that, uh, you know, almost like my English. <laughs> uh, and so he, he knows that somebody told him that he was this uh, young uh, winemaker, that he knows the technical French word of vinification. And so he was uh, hiring me uh, when he was coming to, to translate and not to make a that there was no mistake in the translation. And uh, I learned uh, a lot from him because uh, beside everything that we want to say, you know, but uh, I think it was one of the most brilliant uh, palette that I, I saw in my life. I think uh, uh, like that, uh, probably the other two, Andrew Chelechev and Sheldon Wasserman, the, the incredible, incredible. Anyway, and one time I asked it to him, so when you do blend, when you blend the different uh, cask, uh, so what do you think about? And uh, so, and he said to me, ah, blending is uh, like uh, to writing music. And uh, so when you write music and you put the instrument together, you do not choose the, only the loudest instrument. You choose the instrument that they play well together. So immediately I did not got this uh, Think, but later I understood that uh, uh, was that if you have a, a vineyard, like an example, uh, let, I mentioned the Brito del Fiasco, that is a fantastic vineyard that at Zeria Scavino they make fantastic one. So maybe in some vineyards it's so good, but if you use uh, the entire portion that you have, uh, maybe is too strong, is playing too loud. So music is a matter of balance, as you know very well, because your background is there. Uh, so making a blend, uh, I think, uh, of different uh, crew of Barolo is not easy, it's fun. And with Elena, we have a lot of fun doing this. Uh, but it's a matter of balance and elegance, uh, and it's, uh, it's our music, our interpretation, very personal. Uh, That's amazing. We have a little more enthusiasm to that. <laughs> Let's look at, let's look at the, because you're, so you have one wine that's your, your, well, I mean, I think in my opinion, you have two signature wines, but for most people, they would say that Rocca di Castiglione is the, is the signature wine. Uh, and I'd love to show some of Alessandro's maps uh, so we could talk about Castiglione Falletto and what makes it unique uh, in the, in the Barolo area. Um, so, you know, so oh, keep, wow. Yeah, so we're trying this for the full, for the first time, but this is Alessandro's map of um, Castiglione Falletto with some important vineyards. And um, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. I think we need to look at the in the aerial image too. See, sí, Roque is just a question. Qua, just a, the the, the, is, is the it yellow part. The orange one. Uh, this is the picture. This is not quite showing well. Maybe we go back to the other. Maybe we go back to the to, to the. I'll show you this aerial view. So, Hello? Alessandro. Yeah. Can you see the map? Yeah, yeah, I can see the map. So the, the, the rock di Castiglione is only the, 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 the parcel uh, in orange. So, you know, so you can see this long strip of vineyards. But uh, first of all, in my opinion, it's, it would be very interesting to ask uh, Luca about the differences between rock di Castiglione and Villero, because for me, it's very uh, important because two vineyards are 100 meters away from each other, but the, the style of the wine is completely different. And maybe this is, of course, this is too different exposure because Villero is uh, southwest and, and he has a rock is southeast. But I believe that there is something more. Right, Luca? What do you think? I uh, see <laughs> you, are, you are perfectly right, you know. So I think this goes to the geological part. When you talk about geology, and I have to explain, I always use this sign. You know, there is a, 
il Castiglione Falletto e Monforte, il Serra Valdiano, people is not reading, uh, so Arenarie di Diano, Clay Compact Sand and Grey and Blue. No, this is the, and this is a Serra Lunga, red, the soil is red and grey. So th this is rock and Villera. <laughs> Uh, okay. But uh, yeah, there are two vineyards, one very close to the other, uh, but very different uh, personality. Uh, Roque Vineyard uh, is uh, in, in the picture that I think you want to show, is a picture that you take, uh, you took probably from Perno, driving yeah, down to this very narrow road. Yeah, you, you told this in, in New York during the Festival of Barolo, it's the only place where you can see Roque. The Castiglione, otherwise you can see only a small part of the vineyard. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so I suggest uh, to all your uh, reader, Antonio, when they are in the Barolo region, they should take this very tiny little road from Monforte, go down uh, to Perno. Uh, pay attention, please, because it's very dangerous. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, so, let's be very clear about those roads. They are very windy. <laughs> They are very narrow for anybody used to driving in like a city. <laughs> There's no place to stop and take a picture where you're not where you're not risking your life. Other than that, hey. <laughs> not during the snow. Not during the snow for sure. <laughs> Harvest, not when any crazy winemaker might be driving up the road 100 miles an hour, you know. Otherwise, otherwise, you can ask the owner of the Castello di Perno. You can go at the top of the Castello and you can see everything around you. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, it's a beautiful tiny road that every time that you go down is fantastic because uh, it, when he opens, you see Serra Lunga on one side with all these castle and beautiful crew, you know, from Francia, Vigna Rionda, uh, um, Margeria, and so arriving to Lazzarito. And then he, he turns, uh, you see La Morra on the other side with Cappella di Perno there, yeah, it's so beautiful. Uh, then uh, when you pass the village of uh, Perno, uh, the view opens up and uh, you see all Castiglione and Rocche vineyards in top of the Roagna winery. And uh, on the right side, uh, you see part of Serra Lunga, Fontana Fredda and all the Roero region in front of you. It is beautiful view. And uh, when you see a rock from there, you really understand the geology. That is fantastic. Uh, because uh, it, rock means really a cliff. And you see really the, the vineyards like this, at that center, certain point, a cliff yeah, of 100 meters. Another picture if you want. Yeah, we're going to show yes. another image here in a second. We're going to show the, own, the owner breakdown first. But it is very steep. Um, you have to be, it's very easy to go down, but it's very hard to get back up. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, this is the breakdown by owner. And maybe you could show us um, where your parcels are, Luca. This is, uh, this is Alessandro's map of Rocca di Castiglione by proprietor. Okay, I think. Uh, there is uh, a parcel on the right, and the right in the middle. I, I'm the, the one uh, like the small serpent in the vineyard, no? Yeah, it, Snake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is there. Because maybe we are organic, so they are the biological worms that they go around in the vineyard. <laughs> uh, one here and one there. Yes, uh, one at the beginning and the other at the bottom. Uh, both a little bit, uh, not the extreme part, not the extreme part. Uh, and it's very interesting because this road, uh, in, in top of uh, here, there is the glass tube of Ceretto. So it's very easy to recognize it because uh, we are down below with this road. And uh, on uh, my, look in the screen, on my right side, uh, I have a Brovia uh, that makes also fantastic rock. Uh, on the left side, uh, I have a Ceretto that I think uh, put in Brico Rock. I think this, I, I think so. Then a Brovia and so on. The other part, more on the left, uh, direction Monforte. Uh, I have uh, um, Rocche di Viberti 
and uh, another small part that is a private that I don't know who to sell, but it's very tiny. And then there is Cantina Sociale Terre del Bro. It's very interesting because there are two parcels very close, probably three minutes walking, something like that, 100 meters distances and very different. The first part, the one next to the Brovia and Ceretto, is very, very steep. <laughs> so steep that uh, I always say to the tractor driver, in the springtime, when it's wet and the tractor slide down, don't even try to stop. Because after these uh, colorful, there is the cliff. Uh, and I'm sure that at the bottom of that cliff, uh, there are multiple tractors uh, parked there, you know, <laughs> for uh, sliding down. Um, and this part is a little bit more dry, uh, less vigorous, is very typical and classic uh, from uh, the clay compact sand uh, and arenario di Diano. The soil is very gray and blue. There is this kind of blue too for what we say. Uh, that is very typical from the Arenaria di Diano, this composition that go back to 13, 11 million years ago. And uh, uh, the vines there, they really struggle. They, they, is very, they, are, they do not have a lot of energy. So we have uh, to cut uh, the vines uh, probably only twice a year because they don't push a lot. They do not push a lot. And so not too, too much of green harvest because the production is very small. Uh, so it's beautiful, this portion. Uh, the other one, even is so close, uh, for some reason uh, there is a little bit, uh, probably because in the top, uh, when you see from, Dian from Perno, you see this beautiful arenari di Diano, so this clay uh, uh, um, strati, buffer. I don't know, say line. Yeah. And in the top, uh, uh, probably there are a little bit more marna, eh? uh, the one that we see more in, uh, if you wanted to arrive that, the one that we see a little bit more in uh, Villero, on the other side. And here, the soil is a little bit more generous, uh, more rich, and more vigorous. And uh, for this reason, uh, here we have to do some little bit of green harvest, but not too much. So uh, on the right side uh, is always a little bit uh, uh, lower acidity. On the one on the left, a little bit higher acidity, the fruit. Uh, but there is not huge, huge difference, but there is a difference. You know? Even in a small crew as a rocket, how many hectares is uh, Alessandro? Sorry? How uh, many hectares? How many hectares? Is it 16? 16. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's quite, uh, quite small. Yeah, yeah. But, but a question. Uh, but you put everything together uh, after the harvest, or you vinify the two parcels separately? No, historically, we always uh, harvest uh, everything together, both, because they're very, very, very close, and the difference is very millimetric difference but there is a difference but is uh, we never been fired separately also because the parcel are very low our total production of rock as you know is a little bit uh, uh, some bottle more than 3000 bottles so 280 yeah. cases uh, so very very small it will be difficult to make uh, to to vinification uh, but yeah we historically also my father that in 1961 uh, uh, he, he vinified for the first time as a single vineyard crew uh, uh, Roque, he was putting together the, 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 the two parts. Yeah. So let's do what folks are, are, uh, are drinking because we have something like more than about 350 people on this, on this call right now. And or the, whatever it is, I call it a call, but I'm old. I guess it's a webinar. Mm -hmm. uh, we have about 350 people on the call right now. Uh, on the computers right now, all over the world, and of course we're recording the will be available on our YouTube channel uh, for people. But I'm curious to see what people are um, are drinking. So let us tell us what you're drinking. But in the meantime, there's a question about 2015 Roque Luca, which is uh, that there's uh, uh, Helmut says that he read that there's no new wood in the Roque 2015. I don't know if I wrote that or not, but 
but he says that there's a, 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 a scent of wood. Is the malolactic still in barrique in that wine, or maybe it's just the ripeness of the year that comes through in a feeling of- No, I think, uh, I, I think it's the generosity of the vintages that they show probably a little bit more fruit, uh, more fruit forward. Uh, uh, these, uh, no, it's, no, no, I think, I love 2015 uh, because it's a fantastic vintage. Uh, uh, probably will become also more ready to drink than the 16. Uh, but, uh, you know, I will suggest uh, to put aside uh, not to touch anywhere because uh, I don't, yeah, if you if you open if you have a second bottle, hold it. Don't don't drink right now. Uh, I I think in five or six years, uh, ten years, uh, you will have a lot of fun. Also because Roque for us uh, is a wine that we always uh, uh, try to make for the future generation. I think that uh, I passed the moment of my life uh, that I wanted to prove uh, something. <laughs> so I think uh, I think every winemaker when they arrive around 50, they arrive at the moment where they want to make wine that they live longer than that. And uh, so I, I am in this mood right now. So I we are making wine that we wanted that they are uh, they live more than us. So let's talk about that's fascinating. Let's talk about some of the other great families of Piedmont because I see our our viewers are, have opened some pretty amazing wines. Um, one is a 96 from, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, I can't, <laughs> um, 96 Bartolo Mascarello, somebody <laughs> is happening. And it, uh, it, that's an interesting wine. I mean, obviously for a lot of reasons, but Bartolo Mascarello was the first grower that I met in Piedmont. And when I think now about how much time I spent with him and how it is impossible to go there now, I'm really glad that I, spent that time there because he would go there and he would talk to you for hours about everything. I think he might have liked me because, because I was American. He always teased me about American <laughs> but you would be in his office for hours. And I think it's a reminder that these wines are one of the beautiful things about these wines. They're made by, by people and by families, not by consulting winemakers and big, you know, glossy new wineries made by, you know, world-renowned architects. So that, somebody's drinking that, so congratulations. And somebody else opened 2010 Rinaldi Brunate. So, wow. Pevino, no? Wow. Yeah. So, uh, you guys want to add anything about any of those wines or any personal recollections about those two families? Or two of the great old, older families. Of Alessandro, inizia tu, dai. il fatto che io ho dei problemi grossi con l'audio di Antonio, quindi capisco una parola su tre. Mi riassumi cosa che dice. Voleva sapere se hai due brevissime parole eh, su Bartolo Mascarello, la tua esperienza su Bartolo Mascarello. Oh, oh, oh. Rinaldi. Rinaldi. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, go to Bartolo Mascarello so often like Antonio, uh, because uh, for me uh, he was a very, very interesting person, but I was always a little bit I don't, I don't want to say scared. Non so come si dice in Italian, in inglese, uh, imbarazzato. Mi sentivo a disagio. Con, uh, <laughs> Not con, comfortable. Yeah, you know, because it, it, it was friendly, but you know, there was always a, a distance between us. So we talked about something, but then after, after 30 minutes was, was, was enough. No, it's not. It was. It was not like uh, you. So with with Beppe was completely different. The problem was exactly the opposite because you went to him. For, okay, I don't want any information. Five five minutes, Beppe. It's it's enough. And you stay there one hour and a half. And you say every. And you 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 go to the car and you say I have to leave. Beppe. Oh yes yes yes. You have to leave. Okay. Ciao 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 ciao. So you ask, oh, wait a minute, I have to say this. So it takes one hour and a half to go away from the... <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was absolutely a very, a very nice man. But I have to say that his daughter are, in my opinion, really fantastic. Uh, I, well, like, I... I like so much their job. Uh, maybe they are not so... Uh, expansive, so uh, 
uh, as, as Pepe, but you know, very focused on, on, on the quality. And I like very much the style of the one of, of, of the Ma, you know, you know, the only thing that I can say that I'm, I spent some time with both uh, and are two people that uh, they, I respect so much for what they did. Uh, and I learned a lot uh, from their wines. I, looking behind, uh, you know, I, I should to spend more time with them. Beppe, as you said, is a fantastic person and, you know, and always make me happy when I was seeing him. So, you know, was like a very solar person, very uh, positive person and uh, f fantastic. And uh, I, I told the story of Ravera many times. It was when, when, I, when I had the trouble sometimes with my family, with my parents, I always stopped there. And I always had, uh, uh, you know, it, it was always make me uh, laughing and a few nice words, uh, fantastic. Bartolo Mascarello, you know, when I grew up, Bartolo Mascarello was a monument, you know, was uh, like a God making wine at the time. And uh, me too, I was a little bit afraid, but uh, I, you know, sometimes I remember that I want, I call him that I was, I had some of his wine. I try, I, I told my experience, uh, but the, some of the first experience that I had was in the early nineties when uh, was the moment where uh, the consortium was trying to rewrite the, the, the Barolo uh, DOCG. And there was a move, movement, some movement that they wanted to change a little bit the um, telegraphic composition of the Barolo at the time, adding some, uh, um, you know, different grape variety on the Biolo to make a Barolo. And uh, so there was a, the consortium create uh, under Teobaldo Capellano, that was another incredible person, <laughs> and this uh, group to discuss. And every Monday we met in the castle of Barolo. And in one side, uh, there was uh, Teobaldo Capellano, Bartolo Mascarello, uh, Elvio Cogno, uh, Bu and other, and, and supposed to be my father. And my father said, no, 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 I don't want to go there. You, you go there. And uh, so he, he threw me there. And on the other side, there was some Barolo produced a little bit uh, more modernist at the time. And it was a huge, discussion you know between one and the other and uh, i was there like, like uh, 22 23 years old uh, kids uh, in in the middle of these giant people and i remember you know the the brilliant mind of bartolo mascarello uh, you know he, he, every time that also when there was the discussion was going a little bit more uh, higher he was able to calm everybody down you know when the Teobaldo Capellano was rising <laughs> because Capellano was very energetic. He was always able, you know, to calm everybody down. It was a fantastic person. Yes, I learned one, so one, much. One, one word about Teobaldo, because we we see Teobaldo as as a as a traditional uh, producer, but we have to remember, uh, for example. Uh, Beppe Collo was the first one in the 70s to introduce that's one a great bottle <laughs> to introduce the, the concentration of, of, of wine you know, in the 70s. So a traditional producer like Beppe was uh, the first one to introduce the concentration in, 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 in Barolo. And Teobaldo Cappellano was the first one to introduce to introduce a professional tasting room in Barolo. I don't know if it exists anymore, but at the top of the, ca of the castle, there was a big professional tasting room where with all these small boxes where you can, you have to taste like a chicken and the, bo and the glass came from the, <laughs> from the dark window in front of you every time. And this is fantastic because it, it, we always see him as a traditional, but it's, yes, it's true, but it's not completely true, okay? No, I think the other producer who very clearly falls into that camp that is, is traditional and was not at all traditional was Bruno Giacosa. And I, I see that you know, one of our viewers is drinking 90. There's some amazing bottles that people have opened for this. So uh, Clerico, Chabot, Mentin, Ginestra, 2000. I used to love going to taste with them because he would open 
pour, you would taste like Luca, we do with you, three or four vintages from the barrel or three vintages from the barrel, the, the vintage in the bottle. And I learned so much tasting with him. I'll get to Chaco's in a second. Somebody else is drinking 2014 Vietti Ravera, which I love. Oh, they call La Dardi Le Rose, a 2013, another beautiful wine. But Chacosa people thought of as being as a traditional producer. And I probably first found out about his wines reading Robert Parker. But Chacosa was really modernist. You know, he went against his family's business and did single vineyard wines. He had temperature controlled tanks. He sent his wines to the lab for analysis before anybody. <laughs> he had French oak, yeah. temperature control cellar. And so it's funny that there's an image, we have this image of people as sort of being a certain way, but the reality is really quite different. To me, uh, the Bruno Giacomo is the greatest modernist of people. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you, 100%. <laughs> and he never believed in very long aging in barrel either. He liked, sometimes he would release his wines, you know, later in the bottle, but the aging in the, in the barrel was never, you know, super long either. So, um, I just, it's always funny, you have this image of people and it doesn't always match the reality. Uh, there's a really great question here, Luca, that I think would be fun, because I wanna hear from you, Luca, and then I wanna hear from Alessandro too, which is about climate change and the and, and the wines with more alcohol. And so I'm curious, Luca, how is how are you dealing with climate change, one? And then what I think would be interesting from Alessandro to hear is, you know, we've all grown up with a kind of understood hierarchy of vineyards, more or less. You know, I mean, we can argue about which ones are considered the Grand Cruz and which ones are the greatest, but more or less, if you ask, you know, 10 people or 20 people, you're going to get the certain same name, you know, more or less. Then the question is, do you think, Alessandro, climate change might change the way that future generations think of which vineyards are the most important ones? Because that, for me, is a that's not like a 50 year question. So, I, I, I'm not so, I'm not convinced. I'm quite sure that this historical position will remain in the future top one. Maybe you can have five, four, six new MGA that you can compare to the historical, but the historical position will remain in the future. The, 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 the most renowned position in my opinion and i don't know luca if you agree with me but no i think uh, i think it's a global warming but i think for me is the global warming yes because every year we break a record of temperature or whatever uh, but for me more than climate change is also the the climate is changing because everything is more extreme we have more rain more hail more everything is so incredible but uh, for sure uh, i think some vineyard they will remain as a blue chips a sure value let's say uh, but on top of this uh, we are adding i think as happening also in many other wine regions in burgundy or so other crew other vineyard uh, are changing and uh, are becoming much better than before because uh, one of the example that uh, I think somebody was drinking Ravera, uh, the 14 that you mentioned, Ravera was a vineyard that uh, uh, in the in the 70 uh, nobody was giving too much uh, too much shit to that vineyard. <laughs> Let's say uh, the first one to uh, trust in that vineyard was uh, the Walter Pissora and Nadia, the Conio that they bought the property there. But uh, in the 60, in the 70 when the climate was much different than today because uh, we struggling to arrive to maturation. In the 60, in the 70, I was hearing Saturday, Jeremy saying that in the 60, in the 70s, in the 50s, they were uh, the chaptalization, you know? <laughs> and now they forgot about the chaptalization. In Piemonte was exactly the same, you know? We, uh, we struggle with uh, sugar in the 60, the 70s, in the 80s. Uh, Right now, we have a little bit too much sometimes. And vineyard as the Ravera, and this is an example that in the 16, the 17, they had in some vintages hard difficulty to arrive at the complete maturation. Right now, they are fantastic. Probably in Ravera today, we have the same climate condition that in the 15, the 17, in the 15, the 60, they were in Canubi 
or in the lower part of Brunate. Is yes, easy, yes, uh, yes, but in my opinion, Luca, what we forget every time is that there is the producer as well. Oh, and, absolutely. Uh, the climate is changing, but the producer is changing as well, in my opinion. This is why the top position will remain top position, because you are able to manage different climate conditions. And this is why, okay, you have the Valera that is better than in the past, but uh, Canobi is always Canobi, Rock is always Canobi, and Villero is always Rock, uh, Villero, because there is a producer that uh, learned to manage the situation. And in my opinion, during the Festival Barolo, Roberto Conterno say, said uh, one thing that is, in my opinion, is very important about climate change. He said that, he said that uh, the big difference is not during the summer, uh, because I remember perfectly in the 70s, I, I, I was born in Milano, I lived in Milano. So you know perfectly, Antonio, how Milano could be in, in, during the summer. So in the 70s, it was very, during the summer was really impossible to sleep at night because it was very, very hot, you know? What is changing is, is, is the last part of the season, is September, October, in the past, in the 70s or in the 80s, when it started to rain, it, it lasted uh, one week, 10 days, okay? Now, the climate during the final part of the season is more stable, no? And this is the reason why we have so many good vintages in, in, in 10 years compared to the past. And this is very important to remember. See, and also, if I have to add, as growers, we are also adapting, trying to adjust sure. the, you know, the, the green harvest is less than years ago. I never was a fanatic of a huge green harvest, uh, but I remember in the 90s, there were producers that they were making three cluster each vine. And right now, everybody is uh, around uh, 60, 55 and 60 hectares for hectares, you know, because, uh, and then, you know, we more grass on the field. We leave canopy to cover, to make shade. Uh, that, you know, there is something that we can do not too much. Uh, we, we, there is a lot of things. I think the, the future, uh, the working in the vineyard uh, will be even more important than the past. So here's a, here's a map of, of your map, Alessandro, of Ravera. And you yeah, can recognize. <laughs> nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this mine. <laughs> huh? Oh, it's mine, yeah. I, I, I can recognize, yes. <laughs> so. It looks familiar. <laughs> Definitely not my map. Uh, thanks for sharing this, Alessandro. Here you can see that on the southern part, well, it's not the southern part, but the, the, the bottom part of the paper, the cluster of Vietti vineyards. And you have the Elvio Cogno sort of cluster and then more Vietti vineyards to the, to the right. But what a lot of people um, and other places too, what, what other people, what maybe people don't know, um, is that the Ravera is also the core vineyard for the Castiglione wine. Right, so how, what's the selection that goes? You obviously make the, the vineyard, this is the wine, you know, one of the wines that I love of yours, 99, but what is the, what is the, how do you, I think you have about four hectares in Ravenna, if I remember correctly, right? 4.2, something? Mm -hmm. See, it is one of the largest crew that we have. And uh, yes, it is a parcel. Uh, I am always surrounded uh, uh, with uh, Walter and Nadia wine, the wine vineyards. I think they make a brick of furniture from there uh, yeah. up to my property. Uh, that is also another fantastic wine that I like very much. Uh, but these vineyards, uh, uh, as you see, we is quite big for us, uh, and there are different parts with different age holes. We are able to make uh, three casks, sometimes three and a half casks. Uh, <coughs> And uh, some of them, uh, you know, that was a true going to experiment that I told uh, many times this story. That, uh, the, the 99 that you have uh, there, this is was pre, uh, pre
pre-philosopher, I say, <laughs> pre, <laughs> pre, <laughs> because uh, I stopped uh, to make a rally in 2000, and uh, it was one of our most successful wine. Because remember, in 2000, I got a 98 point from Wine Spectator. In 2001, it was fantastic vintage. I stopped to make it because I was not very comfortable. I was very good, but it was our little bit more modern interpretation, let's say. So it was a moment uh, where uh, it was much easier in 2001 uh, to make a more modern Barola. I went to the opposite side to make a more traditional. And I did a 10 year of experiment and I came back with the 2010. But, uh, Yes, we make a tri cask uh, uh, with a longer maceration and uh, aging in reduction. And of these tri cask, uh, after three years, we select uh, the one that uh, we like more, the more fragrancy, the more delicate, this beautiful strawberry fragrancy, orange skin uh, that I love from Ravera. And uh, we bottle as Ravera, the other two, two and a an half, uh, three, sometimes uh, they are uh, uh, the backbones for the Castiglione. Yes. And I still remember very well the time that we, you gave me 100 points the first time in 2010. Uh, you, you know, was, I remember that uh, I, I blended all the other two casks, and I'm still doing it right now, like this, on the Castiglione. And I think you call me and say, oh, Luca, I'm going to give you 100 points on the Ravera 2010. Are you happy? And I said, oh, fuck. I already blended the other two casks in the Castiglione. <laughs> yeah, you're thinking, <laughs> like you're thinking more. with somebody else because I've never done that once in my life, but maybe some other critics. <laughs> no, no, well, probably, well, probably I read the score, you know, so not all, but I read the score a long time ago. But anyway, I... I was blending the. I was blended the, in the in the in the other casket was in the Castiglione. So it was. Uh, but anyway, yes, it's a fantastic vineyards, and uh, that is. Uh, I, I like a lot. I like it very much. And, uh, uh, and another beautiful uh, expression of Ravera, as I mentioned before, is the Brico Pernice, that is there. Uh, that. Uh, Slightly different interpretation in the winery, our to the Conio, but uh, also a beautiful wine. Yeah, that's an obvious Conio one, of course, yeah. And so we're, we're up, almost up against our time limit, so I'm just curious to hear, Alessandro, what are you, what are you drinking? Because you have a very special wine. This one. Lavoro Disobediente. Il Disobediente, yeah, exactly, 2010. From Fantino. From, from uh, Alessandro Fantino. I, I don't I don't remember exactly because it was refused by the commission of, of the DOCG Bureau, right? Exactly. And it, it is a wine coming from Dardi, from the uh, region of Dardi in, in, in Lucia. Very, very nice, uh, very nice vineyard near the vineyard of Beppe Colla, so near Dardi Le Rose. And I like it really. It, it was a three, four years that I didn't taste it. And now it's showing amazing. It's a very, very nice wine, very well balanced. Not so powerful as you can expect from our 2010, but really uh, full of elegance. I, I like it so much. I have prepared this bottle for today's dinner, but I said, okay, I can open now. And it's like, it was a good idea. Do you, do you know something more about this wine? It's always a risk. Uh, sometimes when I do that, there's no wine left for dinner. Um, what about you? We were, we were talking. We were talking about people who likes to talk a lot, like Beppe Rinaldi. Alessandro Fantino is another one. When, yes. you, when you go to the cellar, uh, there is no way to go back to go to to, to go back to the car <laughs> because you start talking about the wines and many other things. So. Uh, what about you, Luca? What are you drinking? I know you opened some nice wines. I had uh, already uh, uh, Barbera from Capellano. Wow, that's very rare. I, I, I like uh, the Gabuti. That is, uh, you know, I, I love Augusto wine. I, lo I love the, 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 
the Teobaldo, and I like uh, so much also the wine from Augusto, and uh, he's fantastic person, as the, his father, yeah. and they, they are wine are amazing, uh, you know, even starting from Barbera going up, and then uh, before I had uh, another very interesting wine that uh, is uh, Timorasso, uh, oh. that is uh, La Colombera, Il Montino, there were, uh, this there were some questions about Timurasso. People want to know something about Timurasso. I stole some messages now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's, what, that'd be a nice way to close, Luca, but you have two minutes. So, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, that, that, I, I do fast, but uh, you have to ask my wife uh, because uh, this uh, it was a project that uh, Elena uh, pushed us so much to do because she loves so much. Uh, the Timorasso, and she she inspired all my life uh, as a way. She was always pushing me, you know, to do better. And uh, that we, we love, we both love Timorasso. We talk about geologically because it's a region very similar geologically to Langa. And this is incredible. Uh, when uh, we went with Elena the first time uh, in Mont Leale in that region, that this is the part of Piemonte that go through Lombardy. Uh, the first time we were there, and for me it was like a shock because it was like to go back in Langa when I grew up in the 70s. So there were some vineyards, peach tree, uh, land, uh, forest. Right now you go around Langa and there are vineyard, 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 vineyard. <laughs> And so I think it's the region that has an incredible potentiality. It is an autochthon white grape variety that uh, age extraordinary very well. I had uh, from Walter Massa, from Colombera, from others, uh, wines uh, uh, 10 years, uh, uh, even more uh, older. They, it's one of the few white wine from autochthon grape variety in Piemonte with long aging potential. I, I li, little bit oily with some aromatic personality. I think he's a, somebody called the White Barolo. He's a, not a nice name that I like to give, but for sure he's a white wine that will age as good as some Barolo. Well, thank you, Luca. That seems like a great way to end. And it was really a pleasure to spend this time with you, Luca and Alessandro. Uh, Obviously, we're in this crazy world of social distancing, but hopefully this hour that we can spend together, uh, you know, with, with 350 people around the world, just that's just live, uh, is you know, bridge that gap. All of our shows will get put on our YouTube live, our YouTube channel, and then they'll get put on Instagram TV so we can see it for a very long time. Uh, people again. Uh, I know it's Easter. I didn't get a chance to ask you what you're drinking for Easter, but maybe you can write that to us and we'll post it somewhere, maybe on social media. Thanks again. Thanks again, everybody for watching. Tune in tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern time at, uh, with Tegan Pasolacco of Sandlands. It's going to be great. And uh, be well, be safe. Talk to you soon. Ciao. Ciao. Grazie.